You're listening to CBR's Dynamic Duos, a podcast featuring cool people from comics, TV, movies, and video games, interviewing each other about their work, their lives, and their takes on pop culture. I'm Tiffany Crivelli, and for this debut episode, we've got two absolute titans from the world of comic books, Todd McFarlane and Robert Kirkman. These award-winning comic book creators have had such a massive impact on the industry. Todd's created fan-favorite characters like Spawn and Venom, and Robert's behind hits like The Walking Dead and Invincible. These two go way back, and they've got a lot of fun stories to share. When you're done listening, please take a second to subscribe to Dynamic Duos and give us a rating. Now, take it away, Todd and Robert. Hey, Todd. How you doing? Robert, look at This is kind of coincidental because literally a couple days ago, I forgot we were doing this, and I was going to give you a call and catch up to you. So we can kill two birds with one stone. We can catch up with each other. And I guess let people eavesdrop uh, on the conversation at the same time. So that's that's great because I think all of our conversations are fit for public consumption. <laughs> so you know we have nothing to hide. There's there's <laughs> certainly never any griping or anything that's told behind closed doors. It'll be great. Here's the thing. First off, how was your how was your Christmas? Did you have a good time with your family? Eh, you know I could take it or leave it. Okay. And. <laughs> And what about the pandemic? How did the pandemic go for you? The pandemic for me definitely ruined my confidence as far as doing interviews goes because I was doing interviews on like a regular clip and I got real used to it. And I was like, oh yeah, whatever, interviews, all it's all good. Then I went like a good like year and a half without talking to anybody ever. And so now I feel like I'm incapable of having a conversation that's not stilted or awkward in some way that's 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 where that's where the pandemic left me so this is gonna go great we're gonna go good here's here's what i learned during the pandemic i still forget to hit mute and unmute during a zoom you would think after a couple years and doing hundreds of zooms that we would have at least learned that one button turn it on turn it off right but i still mess that one up but anyway hey let's talk about comic books a little bit let's do it um what 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 do you got coming down the pipeline that I should be excited about and henceforth everybody else on the planet. Oh, look, I mean, uh, you know, I'm still doing Firepower, my fantastic yeah. comic book series with the yeah. uh, esteemed uh, Christopher Somney, Matt Wilson, Russ Wooten. Got a great team working on that book. Uh, super excited. We're on a bit of a hiatus right now, if I could be uh, c- completely clear, but uh, we'll be back <laughs> soon. And uh, well, so, so you're doing a comic book that's not coming out. Listen, man, not all of us can be putting out four no, I'm just asking the question. Comics. It's a yes or no question. It was just a national question. It wasn't supposed to be a big detail. So, okay. So look forward to the to- the comic book he's working on. It's not coming out yet. Okay. Come on. It's How, on a bit of a hate. It's like a little three, four month window. I don't know. I don't keep track, but I've got the uh, Walking Dead oh, Deluxe yeah. coming out. We're doing Walking oh. Dead in color every month. That's pretty cool. Got Dave McKegg coloring Charlie Adlard's art. Do some fun stuff in the back where I overanalyze the issue and chat about what, you know, the thinking behind it was. Uh, uh, some people seem to like that. Oh, that's like a like a Walking Dead, Talking Dead type thing. A little comic. bit, a little bit, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's like Talking um, Dead on paper. But, uh, talking- but yeah, and that comes out uh, twice a month. So, uh, you know, we'll get through the run a little quicker than we did the first time. You know, that's that's keeping me on shelves while uh, my other stuff takes a little bit. A little bit longer so I, because I'm spending a lot of time working on the Invincible television show. So Right. How's that going? Every time I'm talking to you, you're like a big shot. You're always in the writer's room or something like that. You go, Todd, I've... <laughs> I've got Hollywood people on the other line. I have to go now. So I'm going, uh, okay. So how, but you're, it seems like you're busy with that a lot. How, how, how busy does that keep you these days? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's probably the, what I spend the majority of my time on right now. It, you know, we're knee deep in production on it. I don't know exactly when this interview is coming out. You know, there should be some announcements. I think there's announcements later this week. You know, we're coming back later this year. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good because. I think on Twitter and anytime I do anything where I engage in public, people are hammering me about how long it's taking for season two to come about. And, you know, look, I'm frustrated, too. I I wish I could tell everybody uh, (laughs) all the amazing cast that we've added for seasons two and three and all the great stuff that we're doing. But, you know, people are just going to have to wait. This kind of stuff takes time. Throughout this year, we'll be rolling out more stuff. And so there will be less mystery as to what's going on. And so I'm really excited to be getting to that point. Look, ladies and gentlemen, Hollywood moves at its own pace. And yeah. they don't really sort of phone us and ask us whether we're okay with the pace that they do. So anytime, here, here's what I've always said, Robert. If you and I, I mean, because, you know, again, it is frustrating because we, we do comic books and they come out, you know, sometimes weekly, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, we've got a comic book every single week. And it's going, man, Hollywood, why is it move so slow? But I'm going to guess 
that if we were spending $100 million on each one of our projects called the comic book, we would probably think about it a little bit more too, <laughs> right? We're going, ah, it's a comic book. Don't worry about it. I'll do another one next week. They're, they've got a lot of money invested and I get it. So they have to really chew on it and think about it and make sure everything's perfect. So time just gets stretched and it's not basically the pattern that you and I are used to in comic books or toys or any yeah. of that stuff. So when, when you, you spend a hundred million dollars on a project, that project has to make at least a hundred and one million dollars. <laughs> Wow. And, yeah, and that's yeah. a lot of pressure. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of time and care goes into that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what, what Hollywood realizes every now and then is that, uh, all that time and care sometimes doesn't work. Well, I, I, let's even give people the math of Hollywood sort of simple math. If they're doing a movie, right? Yeah. If they're doing a movie. Essentially, we'll use simple math, but they get 50% and the theaters get the other 50%, right? People always go, Oh my God, open up to a hundred million dollars. The studio doesn't get all of that. They got theaters to get some of that. And so if you hear that somebody's got a $200 million budget for their movie, their, this movie has to get to about 400 million gross combined globally so that they can get half of that so they can get to basically break even. So when, when I see the big budgets on movies, I'm always going, wow. And that's not even sometimes including their advertising that, uh, that somebody's got their neck way stuck out on some of these movies. So this is why I think horror movies are so amazing for people when they can make it for five or 10 million. And it's like they basically make their money back on the opening weekend and then everybody's relaxed. But you've got a 200, 250 million dollar budget movie in Hollywood. Whew. Woo, here we go. Here we go. Oh, so. Todd, that that <laughs> you jogged my memory. Another thing that's uh, making my comic books come out later is I got this uh, this Renfield movie opening on. I think it's April fourteenth. So I am very very well versed in all of this. <laughs> these budgets have to make this much, or this isn't going to break even, and you're going to get kicked off this lot in an unceremonious way. Yes. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we got the Renfield. Yeah, the insurance around. people. Gonna, you're talking to great. the insurance people who, who <laughs> yeah. were there. <laughs> Talk to us about Reinfeld a little bit. With, 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 uh, Renfield's a, it's a movie Rainfield. about uh, Dracula's henchman, Renfield, who's uh, oh, yeah, you yeah. Know, from the original novel and played by Nicholas Holt. And he's a guy that, you know, is just absolutely miserable, is, is kind of sick of working with Dracula. He's this, uh, you know, this guy's slave, like doing all of his, uh, you know, his bidding and things. Uh, over the course of the movie, he decides, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. That uh, results in conflict with uh, Dracula, who's played by Nicholas Cage. And so it ends up being kind of a, uh, you know, a great rebellion movie that, you know, has a guy standing up for uh, for himself for the first time and, and the journey that he takes in order to do that. And it's a extremely violent horror <laughs> comedy. What? Those actually worked. Those actually work if you saw Violent Night. The oh, Christmas Violent Night movie. was great. Right. I just go, here we go. Um, what, what are you doing on that movie anyway? Uh, I mean, I produced it and it's based on, uh, I wrote the treatment for the movie. So like the original story was my idea. And then I got the extremely talented uh, Ryan Ridley to uh, come in and write the screenplay and flesh the story out and do all the hard work. And then uh, Chris McKay is our director. The whole Skybound crew came in and produced the movie. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty cool. And so let me ask you a question then. Just, I'm curious sure. if, if, it, if it works and does what it, you want it to do, what does that mean? What does that mean for you and your company? Well, like it you means do, we're, you're going to do more. You're going to like, I mean, what's, where, where, where's that fit into the Robert Kirkman sort of cottage community of businesses and creativity? Yeah. I mean, you know, Skybound does a lot of stuff. We've got our, you know, video game side. We've got our comic side. We've got yeah. our TV side. We've got our movie side. I think Renfield has been our main focus for the movie side. If it ends up being successful, uh, you know, hopefully there's a Renfield cinematic universe in our future. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe we'll do a sequel. I mean, there's definitely ideas on how to continue that story. But, you know, one thing I'm really proud of is there wasn't a drive from Universal to kind of like, you know, chalk this movie up with like Easter eggs and, and like unresolved tangents that would be, you know, pushed into another movie. Like they really pushed us to try and make this as as good a movie as it could be to be able to stand on its own. You know, kind of like how the first Star Wars movie like really was its own like standalone piece and wasn't really about like building this, you know, larger thing that it became. So, uh, you know, the option is there to do a sequel, but it's not it's not like baked in in a way that will distract from the first movie. All right. Let's get back to comic books. Yes, that's please. Where you, that, that's where you and I make make our 
DNA. That's a DNA in our in our blood. So what what got you into into the comic book? I know for me, you know, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you, obviously. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I came I came in I came in at when like George Perez was doing Fantastic Four and the X Men, and Byrne was just beginning his, and Claremont were just beginning their run on the X Men. And, and they're just, you know, J- J- John Romita Jr. was just jumping on to Iron Man. In hindsight, those were kind of big moments in the comic book sort of lore that I was like smitten with. And I went, oh, man, I'm going to see if I can do this thing called comic books or whatever else. But you you remember the books that sort of caught your attention when you were that when you were young and went, man, I'm going to try this gig called comic book. I feel like this is a leading question, but, you know, I started reading comics in, uh, you know, the early 90s, maybe yep. a little bit in the late 80s, 89, 90, somewhere around there. How old, how old, how old would you have been? Then? 13, 14. And so I was, uh, I, was about, uh, I was about 16. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Around that time, there was a lot of exciting comics coming out by guys like Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld and Eric Larson and nobody else. <laughs> I know the nobody. <laughs> You know, it was it was a it was an exciting time because and, you know, like I think history knows this was largely uh, encouraged by you. But it was a time when artists were kind of taking control. You know, Jim Lee was plotting his stories. Rob was plotting his stories. You and Eric were, you know, taking on full writing duties and kind of, you know, injecting like more of your influence in the comic books at the time. So the storytelling became a little bit more fast paced, a little bit more bombastic. The drawings were, you know, bigger and splashier and you know, it was just really an exciting time for comics. And so I kind of came in like right as that was kicking off. You know, it's it, it's it's probably why I like, you know, really fast paced, really energetic things that that excite me. It's that's the kind of movies that I prefer. It's kind of TV shows I prefer. It's kind of comics that I want to make. It's kind of comics I enjoy reading. So really, you know, it was kind of that like unique window. You were gonna in, be a, wait, do you want to be an artist or writer or what? What was it? I mean, when I first, yeah, when I when I was fourteen, I wanted to be a you know writer artist. That was definitely the goal. Oh, you were going to be Frank as Miller. I went into my as I moved from my teens into my twenties. I, I realized that I wasn't uh, quite as talented as I probably should have been, and so I gave up the whole uh, art thing. But you know, I dabble every now and then. I've done a few. Uh, I've done a random cover for you here and there, or uh, yeah. you know, like like I do layouts and I do cover layouts for people. I've done layouts for some of my earlier books. You know, when I every now and then an artist will be like, "This scene you wrote doesn't work," and I'll be like, "Eh, look, you put the guy here, you put the thing here. This goes here. Like, try it like that." And they're like, "Oh, okay, cool." Or sometimes they say that doesn't no, work. I have to. I have to. I have to. I have to remind Robert. I have to remind people that go look at issue Spawn issue two hundred. The first six or eight pages, I forget how many. Robert Kirkman penciled those, right? I penciled like them you... very roughly. Let's let's just say I was I was assisted quite a bit by the inking, but uh, but yeah, you know the the rough structure of those pages. That's right. Uh, that no, was but me. I'm just saying that like people go, "Wow, Robert Kirkman's doing some drawing." Go, no, go take a look. Go take a look at those. Like he, like again, I get it. The odd writer's doing a cover. You've even done it for me. But I'm going, no, go take a look at his storytelling. They were actually pretty good, dude. I wouldn't have printed them on, on anniversary books if I didn't think they were that good. So oh, they were Tom, good. That's, that's, very, that's very flattering. Thank you for saying no, that. No, they were. <laughs> I, I was actually, actually, I remember when they came out, when you send them to me, because I, I, in all honesty, Robert, got to tell you, the bar wasn't too high. So I was like, okay, I just do this for Robert. He's that famous zombie writer dude. And he happened to be my partner. But uh, you you did the pages and I I was holding my breath and then they came across and went wow actually these, these you actually surprised me let me just say I remember they came and you actually surprised me so although I did I did embellish you a little bit with the ink and I I didn't have to work at it that hard let me tell you I've had to work harder on other people's work for sure so <laughs> name so. names who else no. who who'd you have to work harder on come on Todd do, no, I, do it I will I won't I won't say it. I won't say it. Well, we we won't we won't go we won't go there. The, when when you were a kid and you were going to break into comic books because I, I I don't know we I, 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 maybe we all did this maybe not. Did you ever create like Spawn was created when I was a kid, right? When yeah. I was in high school, and then years go by, he sat in my portfolio, and then we start Image, and I pull him out, and Spawn becomes my guy. So, is there anything that's that you did afterwards that was something you you created on your own, like? When you were just dabbling, trying to break into comic books, that, that later on you went, "Oh, I'm in! I can pull out character out of my portfolio." Yeah, I uh, I created a ton of characters all throughout high school. You know, 
some of them embarrassing, some of them yeah, yeah. okay, most of them not great. When Invincible and Walking Dead had first took off, I did uh, a bunch of other books. I did Tech Jacket. I did a book called Capes. I did a book called Cloudfall. The book that I did called Capes was about like it was a it was a, a, a nine to five superhero like precinct where superheroes like punched a time clock and you know they they got into conversations about overtime and you know health insurance and and it was like a corporate <laughs> superhero gig. And, that was like, uh, was like you were, that's what you created when you were 14? Well, so all of the, like two or three of the main characters were new and were created for that book, but that book was largely populated by all the superheroes that oh, I, I had created in high school. So like there Visually. was a guy named, there was a guy named Superball that shot Superballs. So he was okay, kind of yeah. like Spider-Man only instead of, it's kind of like a cross between Spider-Man and Speedball because he shot like bouncing rubber balls that yeah. somehow I guess he used as a superhero. Like that was a guy I created in high school. There was a guy called the Gorilla, which was a guy that was stuck in a gorilla suit. Yeah. I don't even know if that guy had powers, but you can see him running around in the background. He's just a guy. You can see his face like inside the gorilla's mouth. This is like a gag on the rhino, I guess. I don't know. Some of them were okay. I did have one character in high school that was, uh, he was called Buggy Master because in, in Kentucky, where I was from, you would call a shopping cart a buggy. And then uh, this guy had Magneto's powers, but he didn't know it. He thought he could only control shopping carts because... The first time he used his powers, he you he moved a metal shopping cart, so he could only you he could only like push shopping carts around with his magnetic powers. That was a funny gag. Every now and then, I had like serious characters, but those were all stupid and embarrassing. The funny ones I can I can still talk about. There was a guy named Strong Arm who had a big arm. One arm. Yeah, he had one big arm. Yeah, one big arm. Yeah. So, yeah. he was pop, so he was pop, pop, pie on one side. Yes. So, Todd, I think what I'm saying is none of my characters rose to the level of Spawn. <laughs> what? Well, hold on. I hold on. Let's. I can't believe that with Buggy Master. So I'm a little bit. I'm. I'm. I'm sitting here a little bit speechless right now, thinking mm -hmm. Buggy Master should have should have made the cut. So no wonder you didn't make his artist come again. <laughs> that was in your portfolio when you were trying to break in. Those are your characters. You didn't yes. want to do Captain America Wolverine. You go, no, I got Buggy Master and I've got a well, uh, microwave dude. You and your compatriots at Image Comics really did me a solid because that revolution of, you know, we're going to go form our own company and we're going to go do our own thing happened when I was like 14, 15. And so my desire, like the thing that as a teen, like drove me to want to be in comics was the idea of creating my own characters and, you know, steering my own destiny and doing my own thing. So I, you know, like I had sketchbooks, you know, that were older where I would, you know, trace Spider-Man drawings and things like that. But from like 1992 on, all my sketchbooks were just design sketchbooks and like development sketchbooks for various characters and various stories and different worlds and things like that. That's why I'm not a very good artist. Like I stopped trying to draw environments and people and people moving. And I just moved into costume design and concepts and things like that. So every drawing I did from that point on is basically just like a person standing up and I'd be like, okay, he's got a shoulder pad here. He's got an eye patch there. He's got some scars here. Like I say, it was the nineties and, and that's all I would focus on. So that's, you know, like you guys benefited me in that my drive was always to create my own worlds, but hurt my drawing ability because I never tried to actually draw anything real from that point on. All right. So let me, let me ask you a strange question. Maybe at what point, so you're in the industry, you're breaking the industry, right? At what point when you broke in, did you think that you were a success? Was it, was it the moment you broke in or was there sort of like a book or a company or a place or a time when you went, man, I'm doing this book, this like, like, I'm I'm okay. I'm 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 going to have a career here and people are going to actually maybe even know a little bit about my work. Yeah, I mean, my path was through self-publishing. I did that yes. book Battle Pope and I published yes. it myself and all that got me was debt. Right. So I was spending a bunch of money to get that book out and the book was not generating any real income and so it was just, you know, like racking up debt nonstop. Then I started doing books at Image immediately at like eh, like a year or two after that and 
the image books were always breaking even, but I wasn't doing anything to counteract all that debt that I had amassed. And it wasn't until like year two or three of Walking Dead and Invincible where I was actually able to pay my mortgage and it seemed like I had like a, a like a steady. That's that's what I'm looking for. I had steady income. And I was like, oh, look at that. I'm I'm not lying in the floor shaking, like wondering how I'm going to pay my electric bill. This is exciting. And but you, I think doing, but you were doing but you were doing work at Marvel, too, right? Yeah. I was doing work at Marvel. And I think that was that was helping a little bit, but it wasn't until the image books took off where because like in, in Marvel does, you know, pay very little. So Marvel, I was still I was still kind of eking by and I was and I was like, but I wasn't like starting to pay off debt and I wasn't starting to like actually be OK. I was just kind of like barely keeping my head above water. I yeah. don't I don't want to completely discount the the time at Marvel, the time at Marvel, you know, it definitely helped get my name out there. And it definitely, you know, was uh, de it was, you know, much more money than I was making self-publishing. One thing that helped me very early on is that Marvel had this thing called the Epic line that yep, they were I, doing yep. in like 2004. Yeah, that's where I broke in. I broke in. Well, broke so in. that was the original Epic line that had died. And to bring the name back, they uh, Bill Jameis devised this pretty brilliant plan that, you know, on paper sounds great, where they would get new creators that hadn't quite broken in yet. And they would say, we will give you a $5,000 budget to produce a book for us. And when I'm self-publishing, like a $5,000 budget might as well be a million dollars. I was like, wait, what? You're going to give me $5,000 to produce a comic book? Like, I've got guys drawing comics for like $800 because like, you know, like no one is making any money whatsoever. They, they contacted me. They signed me up for this program. I started doing this Sleepwalker book. And, you know, like the majority of the money goes to the penciler inker. I think I kept like 600 bucks. And, and you know, like I hired a colorist. Like I put this whole thing together. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm doing Marvel books. Like I've totally made it. This is great. And then right after we finished issue one, they just called and they said, uh, hey, so uh, we shut the whole thing down. You're fired. And uh I know you did a lot of work on issues two and three, but we're not going to pay you for that because we, we're never putting it out. Sorry. And that happened like two weeks before Christmas. <laughs> so my very first interaction with Marvel was the most disappointing, most unstable, like representation of what working for Marvel was. So from that point on, I, kept, I you know, I. It, there was like a six month period where I didn't do anything for them. And then they contacted me about doing Jubilee and Captain America kind of at the same time, because those were the first things that I did for Marvel proper. But because I had had that experience with Epic, I was like, I can't trust these guys. They're not reliable. Like I can never really look at them as like stable employment. Also, like I was exclusive to them and they send you the exclusive contract and you read it and it says we can terminate this contract at any point if we decide to. And we don't have to give you a reason. And I was like, I thought this like an exclusive contract supposed to make me feel stable. But when you read it and they're like, this contract means nothing. Like we will enforce everything that restricts you in this contract. Anything that could restrict us, not going to happen. And so I always had this like wary relationship with Marvel, you know, because of those things, which is probably why things went so badly. <laughs> well, uh, the two books that they canceled, did you get the keep the stories and artwork? No, because it was their character. It was this uh, uh, character Sleepwalker that I really loved. Oh, you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, so yeah. So work, no money, and don't get to keep the pages. Wow. Okay. You didn't come on yeah. top on that one. Let me just say, in that negotiation, you didn't come on top of it, Robert. No. I, I've, heard, I've heard since then, you've become a shrewd businessman. Not then, right? You're, <laughs> well, you're, some you're, things have to happen to you to make you want to be a shrewd businessman. <laughs> That's it. You, that's right. You, your, your name was Sucker, and now it's Tucker. You've evolved, and so you're, you're, you're a good man. I, I'll tell you when it, when it happened for me. Yeah. It was when I took over The Incredible Hulk. And, and even though I'd been in the industry for a couple of years, and I, I did a couple of years uh, on Infinity Incorporate with uh, DC, I felt that Hulk was the one, and the reason was it was super simple and silly, maybe. It was the book that I thought then that, like, my mom and dad had heard of. Oh. So then it was like, because up to that point, I was just like, oh, 
Bob and Shirley, what's your son do? Oh, he's a comic book artist, right? And it was like, oh, what's he do? What are they going to do? Say Coyote, say Infinity Incorporated? Like, it doesn't mean nothing, right? But now they could go to a cocktail party if they ever got invited to one, which they never did. But if they ever did get to go to a cocktail party or they were at the barbecue, they could go, what's your kid do? And they could go, he draws the Incredible Hulk. And at that point, because it had been on TV and people sort of knew it, it was in the zeitgeist, right? That it was like, oh, your kid, he must be doing quite well for himself. Even though I'd been doing it for three or four years, it was like, you had to have the character to go with it to basically justify yourself for the rest of your family. So for me, it was like, I'm doing the Hulk, and that was it. And then it was like, I made it. From from here on out, I'm, I'm legit. Uh, and I, w I felt like I was just faking it those, uh, those first couple of months. And I was on my first book, The Coyote. I was the same way with you. I was on that book for three or four months, and they canceled it. Yeah. You're out on the street, and you're going, uh-oh. And I was, I was making 600 bucks a month. So... Okay, you're you're back to making zero. Here we go. Got to get back into this industry. Again. Yeah, the, the highs and lows of the early career are interesting. Like, oh my yeah. God, I'm working on Coyote. It's canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and I got in. I've, I've I've said the story before, and you've heard it. Where I get a phone call because an artist died. Right, an artist, yeah. an artist Don Don Newton died by having an allergic reaction to drinking unpasteurized milk, and so it opened up. And so again, you have these moments where you go, man. If Don Newton doesn't ever drink milk that day. Did I? Would I ever have gotten back in the industry? Right? I was like out on the street. Would I've ever gotten back in? Let alone get get my career going. That ended up basically taking a path. Right? That's that sliding doors question you ask yourself. Yeah. Right. If you don't ever meet, if you don't ever meet Eric Larson on that street corner. I don't know. Or is your life a little bit different? Who knows? Right. So. We, 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 you take the, I keep telling people when I talk to them about business, you got to have a couple of lucky breaks along the way. Cause if you don't get a couple of lucky breaks, it's hard to make it right. So dumb luck. I, I, I'm sure you've heard the story, but I, I, I lied. I had met Eric at the Chicago comic con and I lied to him because we were, con was like winding down and I saw him walking with his suitcase and I was like, Hey man, where are you going? He's like, I'm trying to find a ride to the airport. I got to find a cab. And I just said, I can take you to the airport. Because I had driven to Chicago from Kentucky, so I had my car, but I didn't know where the airport was. <laughs> and this was pre-cell yes. phones and GPS and everything. So yeah. so it's like, if I hadn't lied to Eric and said I knew how to get to the airport, would I be in this career? If I hadn't somehow gotten him to the airport, would I have this career? You know, if, <laughs> if I just had to be on the... You had to get him, you had to lie to get him in the car, and you actually had to get to the airport, Right. Again, we'll t we'll yep. we'll take our break. Bad break for Mr. Newton. Big break for Todd and his career. Right? Actually, yep. was, there was two. There was John Newton passed away. It was on a book called Infinity Incorporated that Roy Thomas was writing, and Don passed away. And then another guy was supposed to come on and take over the book. So I was only supposed to come in for two issues, and then the new artist was supposed to come, and that was it. That was that was all I was supposed to do. And then one issue into those two, they Roy Thomas phones me up and says, the guy who was supposed to take over the book, mail. So we're, I'm looking for a guy. You did the last issue. Do you want to hang out and stay here, right? Like, I need a gig, right? Like, you yeah. know how it is. I just steady work. We need steady work. So that was it. So that guy... Again, I don't know what would happened if he had decided he wanted to do his monthly book. I would have been back out on the street, you know, or maybe doing the odd fill in or something like that. You you take you take it when you can do it and then and then once you get in, you know how fragile being in and out of that industry can be. So oh, yeah. when you get in, it's like I can't miss a deadline. I've got to get all my work done. I've got to do everything right. I can't be a troublemaker. I became a troublemaker later in my career. <laughs> Uh, so it was like, just do all the things that are going to get you brownie points, which for the most part was deadlines, you know, right? Yeah. I, I keep telling people, you can be mediocre, but you can hit deadlines, monthly deadlines. You can have a career in this business, right? So you're, Yeah, too you're, many people don't subscribe to that notion. And it's a little, uh, I don't know, I feel like it's a, it's a bit of a mistake. A lot, a oh, lot of people, look at, a look lot at of it people, the other, uh, if, go ahead. Look at it the other way. If, if you, if you are the best writer, artist, on the planet and you can't meet a deadline. You're no good you're no good to a monthly comic book company. Yeah. You can do covers. You can do a fill in maybe. You can you can do a mini series that, you know, takes three years for you to get it done or whatever. But what you can't do is a monthly comic book. So it doesn't like like in a in an odd way, the skill is secondary, right? 
have all the skill, but you can't get it done, they'll never give you a job. If you're mediocre and you can get it done, they'll give you work from time to time because they need people to get the books done. So meeting a deadline is is early in the career, I would argue, is, is far more valuable than the skill set because the skill set will come as they give you more and more pages and more and more work. You're gonna yeah. get you're gonna get better at it, right? So, I mean, you and I aren't looking at our early work saying it was the highlight of our career, right? So you just go, I got to get in, I got to meet a deadline. We're in a deadline business. Let's go, right? So it's a you gotta a, you gotta look at your career like a bed of nails. You know, <laughs> if you're only gonna make one nail, you gotta make it the best nail ever. You know, to hold everything up. But you do a bunch of you know, hey, look, you know, like uh, do 193 issues of Walking Dead. They ain't all great. No, but you line them all up cushy bed of nails you can lay on because they're yeah. all supporting the whole thing, you know? Yeah. I've had this conversation, Robert, with way, way too many people in our industry, some really big name people. Yeah. Right? Some pe- some super, super talented people. And I think- What are their more- names, Todd? No. And <laughs> the bed of nails, I, I say the same thing. At some point, at some point, longevity matters, right? Yeah. A- a- attrition- matters. And so what ends up happening is that if you've been in the business for five, six, seven years and people like you, it becomes a harder every day that you're in the industry for people that like you to dislike you and your work, right? I mean, maybe you say something, but I'm talking about your actual work. And so there's nothing that if your favorite artist is Jim Lee, let's take a guy, Jim Lee, who's a great artist. Yeah. What could Jim Lee draw today? What could he put on a cover today that people who've liked him for the last 15 years would look at and go, that's it. I'm done with him. It actually, not only, even if he drew a stick man, they wouldn't, they wouldn't throw him away. You know what they would do? Ah, he's given us so much pleasure and all the other stuff. It must have just been a bad day. They will actually make excuses for that stick man, right? So, so it's like at some point, Jim's locked and loaded for the, like for the long run, which basically means what, what, what the upside of it is, is that once your sort of career has been made and you've got your fan base and it's already there, you don't have to obsess over every cover, every page, every drawing, because they're not going to judge you on one panel. They're not going to judge you on one cover anymore. They're going to judge you on your body of work. And they're yeah. going to say, I like Robert Kirkman. I like Walking Dead. They're not going to say, I like Walking Dead number 44 and 87. They're going to go, I like Walking Dead and like you're saying, some are better than others. And they're going to go, I like Rob, or I like Greg Capullo. Okay. I'm sure Greg would point out the issues that he's sort of not that proud of, or for sure, pages that he goes, ah, I could have done better. But it doesn't matter because we just go, we like Greg Capullo and he's in there. And so this is why doing steady work on a regular basis has a great value. I keep trying to tell some of the people in the industry, especially some of the young kids, that the more you do, the, the the more luxury you have of actually having an off day and it won't bite you in the ass, right? Yeah. So like, cool. So yeah, I got, what are you talking about? I got 300 plus issues of Spawn. They're, they're not all winners, right? To me, every 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 issue is, is like giving birth to a baby. You have 300 babies. They're not all going to be handsome or pretty. Some of them yeah, are going to be mean, ugly. You have Some three children. That third one, you're like, eh, well, it's fine. <laughs> so... Yeah. So, I mean, what's, what's the one panel? What's the one panel that would turn anybody off from not liking my sp- Spider-Man? What, what, what could, what, what was the panel I could have drawn that they go, no, we loved all that Spider-Man stuff, but that one panel, that, that's it. We're done, Todd. I'm like Italian. I rip, you're dead to me, right? Yeah. Never. I'm going to another. It can't. You, if, if anything, I would argue, Robert, I don't know if they do it to you. They actually give you more credit, I think, than we're due. <laughs> it's actually the opposite. They start making you and putting you on higher pedestals, even though you go, what are you talking about? There are dozens and not hundreds, of, at times, thousands of people that basically can draw circles around me, right? Like, okay, cool. But if you want to say that I'm better than them, I'll, I'll take it because it's good for the street cred, but it's it's not true. But this is why doing having a body of work Having a body of work matters. I mean, and you know it, doing oh, yeah. 200 issues of Walking Dead, it matters. It does matter. 193. We didn't quite make it to 200. Oh, it was well, a real well, bummer. I'm, I'm, I'm rounding up. I'm rounding up. For you. <laughs> I appreciate that. 
No, I mean, two things. Body of work. There's uh, multiple hey, times on... I go for, I'm gonna, what, one joke. You know, you went to 193, right? Yeah. I've told, this, I've told this to people before that I go, you know, Robert Kirkham quit. And they would ask me, like, why is Robert quitting? Because they love The Walking Dead. Why is he quitting? Sure. Why is he quitting? And I just go, wow. I, I, look, I had a conversation with him. And he said he was going to quit. And he thought, like, what issue should I quit? And so I said, hey, Robert, you know that one cover I did for you in issue 100? It's got 193 blades of grass in it. And you said, 193 seems like a good number. If it's on a cover, we're going to do it. And so it was like, that was it. <laughs> and people walk away going, that's why you did 193? Now it makes sense. <laughs> I don't even know how many blades of grass are on that. It could be 5,000 for all I know. But anyways, I interrupted you. No, I was just going to say, you know, with Walking Dead and Invincible, and I don't know if you get this with Spawn, but like when you've done so many issues, I get fans that'll be like, hey, you had this one thing happen in 120, but this character said this line of dialogue in issue 30. Was that foreshadowing for that moment? And I always say yes. Yes. But it's not always true. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes oh. I had a plan, but not always. Yes, I, I am, sadly, I may be the worst writer in the business in that I do not know five pages from what I'm doing right now, right? I, I, I make almost everything up on the fly. So if any of it ever makes any kind of sense, then it's just because I've got my system down that I can just think in five page increments, not five issue increments. I usually ask the writer, the artist, what do you want to draw? I'll write that story. Okay. And so I'll just make, I'll just make it up on, I'll make it up on the fly. And it seems to, it seems to work. People haven't caught me too much at it. Right. Uh, it, it, it was, that's a, that's a skill in and of itself. There's so many writers out there that, that, that would never be able to do that. Oh, I'm just, you know, coming up with things on the fly. That's, that's a talent. Don't sell yourself short. No, no. Cause sometimes people will do a review of it. I don't even pay attention. And then uh -huh. it's over and they'll do a review of the book like three months later. And I went, I put what in the book? I don't even remember it, right? I put what in the book? That actually wasn't, that wasn't too bad. But I, as soon as it was done, I was on to the next book. I wasn't even paying attention to it. Yeah, sometimes I think fans would be horrified if they knew how much stuff we forget, oh. you know? I mean, I don't want to out myself too much, but I have to reread The Walking Dead because we're doing the deluxe reprints. And so I like make sure the lettering looks good and... You know, I'm doing a commentary in the back, so I have to be like well versed oh, in the yeah. issue. So I I reread the comic now like twice a month, and it's been years since I've read The Walking Dead. Like when I was writing it, I would reread things to make sure I had everything lined up and everything. But once the book ended, you know, my brain was just like, don't need this anymore. Flip. So you know, I read issues of Walking Dead, and I'm like, wait a minute, I did this? Wow, I didn't even know. I didn't even know I knew that was a thing, and I wrote that into a story <laughs> like. Wow, it's was a, I doing I, research back then or have I just forgotten this? I don't understand. The, the frustrating thing is when you go back and you look at some of your art, your artwork or your writing or whatever it is, there are moments where you go, wow. You, in a weird way, you're actually impressed with yourself. You go, wow, that was good. You have no recollection where that came from, right? You go, that, that came out better than I thought. How come I can't replicate that? Because that was not bad. And then yeah. there's stuff that was bad that you go, I don't remember that either, right? And so I, it's almost like playing a sport, you know, where you just go, yeah, I made my 10-foot putt yesterday. I used the same approach, the same, but somehow it didn't go in this time. I don't know. Why does it go in sometimes? Why Why doesn't? I don't know. Why Why do you draw good pages, write good stories? Other times you don't. Why does the dialogue seem natural? Other times it seems stiff. I don't know. It just pours out of you. Today's Wednesday. You got a deadline. You got to get it done. And if you're in the mood, it comes out better than than the day that it doesn't. But if you got a deadline, you got to get it out anyways, right? You got to get you got to get your comic books out. Look at here's is the god honest truth about Spawn. He was never supposed to have a live costume. He was never. It was just issue number one. I just, I don't even reference my own pages, Robert. So I was drawing Spawn. And I sort of kind of had a knowledge of what they look like, uh -huh. and so I was just moving stuff around. And then people came and started writing in saying. How come the pouch was on his left leg and now it's on his right leg? How come he had five spikes on his leg and now it's seven or what? I like whatever because he has a living costume. Yes, he does. Yes, he does have a living costume and it can undulate and it can do whatever it wants. So like we talk about there was no mention of a living costume in those first couple issues. It was just me forgetting what I drew from panel to panel. So 
now? The living costume? What are you talking about? That's part of the folklore. But that was that was something I made up on the fly because I was making stuff up on the fly. So I had to then cover what I was making up on the fly to get to that. So, uh, anyways, we all we all we all have our way of getting getting through life, and it turned out okay. So your your lies turned out okay. My fibs turned out okay. So <laughs> I understand we got to let you get because you've got important stuff to do with your Hollywood folk big shots. Um, Just know that I would rather be doing this. <laughs> no, I, I, let me tell the people before you go here. Sure. I've been been around Robert for you know more than a decade now, obviously, and his, no matter what is going on in Robert's life, and I've I've been around him at the height of when Walking Dead was on TV with twenty million people watching it. So he could have he could have big dust a, a many 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 times. And every time he was in a Hollywood situation or had to be in a place and I was at conventions and he had some big things he had to attend that when he had the opportunity to basically break off and go hang out with the comic people and or talk comic book, he took it every single time. He never once took Hollywood over comic books. And so I don't know if that's I just was lucky or if that's true, but. I sort of always admired that. Uh, I don't know if, I've ever I don't said know that. if it's true. <laughs> well, at least for me, it was. I was just like, "Wow, he's just gonna—he literally, you're gonna stiff the big shots just so you can geek out talking comic books or doing whatever we would do that night." So I always went, "Man, that's a comic book dude right there, right through and through. That's a comic book guy." I, it's nice to sort of dabble in those other areas, but I go at his core, he's a comic book dude. Well, I, I mean, I think that's why we get along so well, you know, like we live, breathe and, you know, eat, sleep and drink comics. So, you know, we do all this other stuff. I mean, you do more Hollywood stuff than I do when it gets down to it. I know you're in L.A. every week. You know, we don't we, you know, it's like it's the, the comic stuff is the stuff that excites us. It's the stuff that interests us. It's the stuff we want to talk about. Like if I'm having a general conversation with somebody, the comic stuff is going to come up. The Hollywood stuff not necessarily is. Yep. So, you know, it's just that's our yeah, passion. You want, the, you want the Hollywood stuff to work so that you can go and do more comic book stuff based on it. Right. Bingo. That is exactly it. Yeah. You guys spend your hundred million dollars making that brand that I control. And I'll take it from here. Thank you. Right. So yeah. Thank thank you guys very much. You 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 played your cards pretty right. Hopefully everybody get excited about the second season of Invincible. We're gonna let you go. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. I'll give you a call later next week so we can talk about people behind their back. Uh, oh, we can't, I can't and wait. We'll, and we'll mention names on that phone call. <laughs> All right, man. This was great. It's great talking All to right. you. Yeah, be good. Thanks, Robert and Todd, for joining us on Dynamic Duos. The first season of Invincible is streaming now on Prime Video. And new Spawn comics and collections can be found at a comic shop near you or wherever comics are sold online. You've been listening to CBR's Dynamic Duos. If you liked what you heard, please let us know by leaving a review. For more interviews and the latest news about comic pop culture, be sure to check out CBR.com. Thanks for listening and see you next time.